I'm Joe Devine, and welcome to Whiteboard Football Extra. Today, I'm joined by Alex Stewart to talk about Romelu Lukaku at Manchester United and Liverpool and their counter-pressing. Both topics we covered in recent Tactics Explained videos on our YouTube channel. You don't need to have seen them to listen to this podcast, but you might like to, um, in which case you can find them by searching for UMAXA Football on YouTube or going to umaxa.com and clicking on the videos tab. Thanks for downloading the podcast and enjoy. Alex, we have a couple of different topics to discuss today, looking back over the last two videos you've been involved in in creating. Firstly, I'd like to ask you about Romelu Lukaku. Um, We made a tactical video about Manchester United's purchase of Lukaku, as part of which you suggested that a 3-5-2 formation might be a good option for getting the best out of Lukaku and Paul Pogba. Um, One thing that happened was a few commenters responding to that video uh, stated their dismay, really, that that players who cost so much money need to have systems and teams built around them. Or, or, you know, when when people make an argument that they're better suited to a particular system, I think the idea is, and I'm not sure if this is really true of any player, but that if a player costs that much money, they should be flexible and, and should fit into 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 any system that the team wants to use. Um, I wanted to ask you about that, because it's, it's an interesting idea, um, but I'm not sure whether we should really be expecting that from, from players like Pogba and Lukaku, or, or really many players at all. Yeah, I I think there's there's a couple of points to make here. The first thing is that the idea of having a player of extraordinary talent and creating a system that allows you to use that player in, in the best way is nothing new. Um, during the World Cup series that we did, we saw a number of instances where teams set up in order to maximise the... It's it's usually with attacking midfielders or or strikers, actually, Um, you know, trying to find the best way of getting a Zinedine Zidane into your side or a Diego Maradona into your side and and building the rest of the team around them. So I, I don't think... Maybe it attracts less attention in international football because those players are so stand out for their nations compared to the other players in the team and also because there's no money involved in international football. So, you know, you, you use what you're given and it's not like you've actively brought somebody in and then thought, oh gosh, what do we do with them now? Um, so the first thing to say, I guess, is that it's nothing new. It happens in club football. It happens in international football. Now, the second question then becomes about purchasing individual players. Manchester United were in the market for a good striker. They were in the market for a particular kind of striker. Um, You know, Mourinho likes to play quite a counter-attacking system. Um, Lukaku was the striker that best fitted that bill, who was available for an amount of money that was reasonable. So I think in that instance, you're not really saying that Manchester United need to drastically change in order to bring him in. I think the point that we were making in the video was really that if you want to maximise both of those players, that formation, the three five two formation, is a particular way of doing that which would seem to work. Now, Pogba didn't play in a three five two last season and he still did reasonably well. So it's not like he's sitting there going to Mourinho, unless you play me in a three five two, I'm going to be rubbish. You know, it's and nor did Lukaku to point that out. Either. No, absolutely not. I don't I don't think anybody has um I don't think anybody said that that these players are coming in and saying to the coach, This is what you must do in order to get the best from me. Um it's merely, I suppose, a way that that we are able to think about it and say, okay, looking at what that squad's strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and what the strengths and weaknesses of those two individual players are, this is a system which would seem to get the best from both of them. I don't think what we're saying is that those players wouldn't work in another system, or indeed that that they have any expectations about what is done with them in, in such a way as to kind of imply that they're demanding a certain style or anything like that i i you know different different teams have preferred formations different managers have preferred formations bringing a high quality player into that yes you would expect a certain amount of adaptation from the player 
but I think it would also be bad business and bad coaching if the club didn't adjust to the qualities of the player that they've brought in for a lot of money. Well, particularly when you have players like Lukaku and Pogba, um, who I think, you know, there's there's a different kind of potential range with, with footballers, I'm sure you'll agree, but Lukaku and Pogba, if you were to play them in, in, in such a way as to get the best possible out of them, they're unplayable. You know, that they, they are going to win you football games regularly if they are being played to their maximum potential. If you're playing uh, Matteo Darmian to his maximum potential... And not just not to you know criticize his ability at, you know in the slightest, but M- Matteo Damian isn't going to win you the football games in the same way if you build a system around him. So I think it only really just make is common sense to you know make sure that your best players are you know have the best possible opportunity to 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 perform well as long as it's not drastically negatively affecting the rest of the team, which I don't think. Um, you know, Jose Mourinho would do anyway. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I, that's why I said towards the beginning of this that it is often around attacking midfielders or strikers that these changes occur. Unless you're David Luiz. <laughs> well, no, actually, I think David Luiz benefited from a system change that was going to happen anyway. I don't I don't think when Conte moved to three at the back, he did it in order that David <laughs> Luiz could play as a I'm going to set up David Luiz. <laughs> yeah, I know, but... You know, that that was a good example of a system change that benefited one particular player, or several, actually, because it, it also benefited Alonso and Victor Moses. But um, I think when you, when you look at, at match winners, then it is players that are playing in attacking midfield or up front, generally speaking, who are going to grab games for you, like Lukaku can, like Pogba can. And being sufficiently tactically inflexible. And we you have to remember with Mourinho that he, yes, he is predominantly a defensively minded coach, but he is incredibly flexible tactically. You only have to look at the way that he set up his teams to target individual games, particularly in European football, to know that he is perfectly capable of making all manner of adjustments in order to get the result he wants. You know, he's not dogmatic at all in the same way that you might say, for example, Arsene Wenger is. So, I was thinking Arsene Wenger as you were as you were saying that. Right, and, and that's why Wenger switching to three at the back last season was such a big deal, because, you know, he basically has not deviated. He, he, he used a 4-4-2 up until about 2004-5, and then he switched to this sort of... 4231 version which was still a 442 in in parts and that's all he's ever really used. Mourinho will happily you know yes the the formation changes don't tend to occur with Mourinho but the use of players in different roles um to get the effect that he wants doubling up of markers for example or getting wide forward players to to play in a particularly disciplined and backtracking fashion etc cetera, etc cetera. the examples are legion so you know, I think if if a coach of his caliber and players of their caliber meet, then it's only natural there'll be some adjustment by the coach to get the best out of them. And I don't think there's anything weird about that. No, no. Uh, we should bear in mind and mention to the listeners that we are recording this uh, at the beginning of uh, well, uh, Monday, the seventh of August, if you must know. Uh, but it won't be released until after the first game, the first weekend of Premier League football has already occurred. So bear that in mind with the, this next question, um, because I'm Alex, I'm going to ask you uh, about Lukaku from a footballing perspective and what it is that he adds to United side. Generally, of course, he might have scored a, uh, a hat-trick. He might have scored seven goals at the weekend, <laughs> and now we're sort of wondering, what is it that he adds to the side? You see my point. Um, but you do know in the video that United were a low scoring side last season it does sound like a cliche but is it you know is it simply goals it's predominantly goals yes um but i think what you so a question like this you've you've got a kind of an absolute answer and a relative answer and the absolute answer is is he is a powerful quick striker very capable with one on ones very capable of putting away chances who will score goals and and his scoring rate is is excellent. The second point's a more relative one to Manchester United specifically. So really since Ferguson has left, the thing that United have struggled with um, 
under Van Hall especially, but also under Moyes, was speed of build-up and the transition from defence to attack being pretty stolid and turgid a lot of the time. Um, that's why Moyes ended up kind of relying on crosses from deep because there, there wasn't that momentum going forwards, um, what people refer to as verticality. Now, what what Lukaku will allow them to do is attack with greater pace because when you had Ibrahimovic up front, um, Ibrahimovic, extraordinary talented player, I mean, even with his age, but kind of almost outside of his age as well. He's still arguably the best striker in the league last season, or one or two or three, the best strikers. Um, But you're not going to get quick build up with him because he likes to drop off deep and link up. He's not as mobile. He's a big aerial presence, which Lukaku is as well. But what Lukaku allows you to do is transition very, very quickly because he's playing on the shoulder of defenders. He's very, very good at running onto through balls and finishing low past the keeper. He's very good at running at defenders that are backpedaling and getting past them um, using a combination of good dribbling and also strength. So effectively, I'm not saying that it allows United to start playing long ball, although it could if they wanted to, Um but that sort of uh, Leicester City with Jamie Vardy style of play where there's a, a quick transition and then a long ball that a striker chases onto and, and makes the most of, which incidentally I think is one of the things that Pogba can really you know, benefit from having Lukaku around for. In fact, you know, the snobs amongst us might uh, start calling that long pass if it's Pogba, uh, you know, making sort of uh, point-perfect passes and Lukaku bringing it down on his chest. Yeah. Well, but but that's that's the thing. United <clears throat> United have gone from having a striker who could take those long passes but would bring them down and look to play somebody else in or possibly turn and shoot to having a striker that can take that pass either on the chest running forwards or even not take it but run onto it and maintain the dynamism of that attack. And that's what United really have been lacking. Now, the odd thing is that actually United have got players like Anthony Martial and Marcus Rashford who who could very easily have done that themselves had they been played. But the 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 way that they they kind of relied on Ibrahimovic last season for very understandable reasons. You know, he's a talismanic figure and he was on a huge wage and he did get them a lot of goals, but it just allows United for the first time really since Ferguson left to have a point of attack that is genuinely dynamic. It's fascinating stuff. Um, as I said, perhaps uh, we will have already seen uh, by the time this podcast is released how United are maybe intending to play, how Lukaku's playing. So let's talk about Liverpool now um, because we made recently a video about Liverpool and counter-pressing as well a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's pretty clear that like... Spurs, Liverpool's fullbacks are integral to that system. Uh, and in fact, generally speaking, across the league, fullbacks are often pushed very high on the pitch. In Liverpool's case, they have a central midfielder or a number six, as we're calling him, sometimes Emre Chan or Jordan Henderson, who will drop back uh, to link defence in midfield. And you know, to that, we, we often talk about formations as a as a set thing. But it seems that when Liverpool do this, their formation shifts from a 4-3-3 to a 3-4-3. And by this, what I mean is the fullbacks push up, the six drops deep. So you have essentially, you know, it looks like a line of back three and then four across the middle. Um, and if if this is the case, Alex, and this is quite a complex question, um, how do we designate what a formation is? And presumably <laughs> this, is, this is quite fluid, right? So if it's changing throughout the game, how can we say that Liverpool are playing a 4-3-3 if their team shape resembles a 3-4-3 from, or when they're attacking, for example? Mm. Or, and in Liverpool's case, actually, when they're defending because the, cause the fullbacks are a key part of the counter-press. Yes. Um, it, it's a very good question. And I think that obviously... F- formations have become more fluid um and I mean, one way of looking at it is is actually the way that football manager the sports interactive game does it which is that your formation 
as laid out in the tactics screen is the defensive stance. And then if it transitions into something different in attack, then you don't really need to worry about that. And I think that is quite a helpful way of looking at it. Um, but it, it kind of goes back to, you know, that, that sense of player shirt numbers or where they stand when it kicks off is in some way, I, I don't want to say it's becoming less relevant because you still have a basic sense of what a player's position and role is. But but players are becoming more and more all-rounded in a lot of positions. I think fullback is one of the areas where we can particularly see that. Um, they're being asked to, to fulfil a number of roles. That's why players like Eric Dyer, who are maybe not outstanding at any one facet of the game, but can do a very good job as a defensive midfielder, as a centre-back, and even as a fullback, are so highly prized. Because the ability to shift formation uh, during the course of a game or to deploy those players with different roles according to who the opposition are is very, very important. You know, football is much less uh, static than it used to be. And you need players that can adapt to the changing circumstances in game, but also who are intelligent enough that if the coach says, right, against this particular team you know we need our one of our central midfield axes to drop back a lot we need the fullbacks to push higher that those players can just go oh okay fine and get yeah. on with that what strikes me about these sorts of systems as well is that they they they're quite complex you know counter pressing for example we made the video about it and obviously it seems in some cases kind of simple but i think what's interesting about it is to me it seems that the players will have to understand the system conceptually rather than just what their role in it is because i think if you know if it if you required for example to see how many what your teammates are doing before you decide what to do in a certain situation that implies that you need to have you know an over the top understanding of what's taking place and that that's quite a lot of information to to take on board which is you know, all of a sudden you know you can kind of understand why when a, a manager like jürgen klopp arrives at Liverpool it might take a year yeah. for the team to you know get to grips with what's happening how long does it take you or I to get to grips with reasonably complex mm. um you know concepts in our working lives not that we not that we have any Alex yeah uh no we don't thank god um no and, and it's not just that because it is it, it is a complex overview exactly like you say you you need to understand what the other it's it you know, it's like the Origio Saatchi four points of reference um, that we've talked about before. You know, the ball, the opposition, your own team and space. Um, and what you're saying to players is not only do I need you to have an understanding of our particular style, which requires you to do X if the ball is here or Y if the opposition are there, but also then to employ that understanding in the incredibly rapid dynamic situation of a football match. You know, that is a very, very difficult thing to be able to do well. And that's why, exactly like you say, when Klopp came in and, and you know, it, it, it took a while and people going, oh, where's this much vaunted Gagan press? You know, it's like, well, they're not yeah. just going to get it overnight. Don't be ridiculous. You know, the, Hold on, guys. Yeah, and, and, you know, you look at most good managers who've had long... 10 years at clubs particularly where they've had a kind of ethos that they want to instill whether that's uh, a tactical ethos or indeed in some instances a kind of a general sense of of style but also of what the club should be like um they've never been around for just a season or two you know these 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 people have have had a long time to get that in place and to <clears throat> and then you start actually and this kind of refers Back to what we were talking about with Pogba and Lukaku. If if you're then if you're then in in that position for that long, and and let's take Klopp as an example. You know he's now been at Liverpool for long enough and got across a general sense of his ideas well enough that he can start looking for players who do fit that system and players where he can say, okay, well, you know, for example, Julian Weigel played this kind of style for me at. Dortmund so maybe he's the answer to our midfield issues or looking at whether players will be able to adapt so it's it's kind of <clears throat> six to one half a dozen to the other in in respect of 
players and managers adapting and 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 you know Klopp is is probably less adaptive in that way which I know is something we're going to possibly come on to in a, in a second um he's more inclined I think to recruit players that will fit with the way that he wants to play whereas other managers maybe will recruit players because they're really good and then see what they can do around them right um, yes but yeah this this is this is complicated stuff you know this is why we can make long videos about tactical changes and history and how systems work and who brings them in because people don't just rock up on match day and go right yeah kind of 442 and watch out for the guy on the left cuz he's quick <laughs> oh, what a shame a simpler time it would have been a lot easier to yeah i mean we would have had less hashtag content but moving on a few people in the comments spoke about this a uh, question to you alex stewart um, the counter-pressing system, whilst very impressive against teams who are attacking you, um, can it be weaker against sides who sit deeper and defend? There are a few, uh, some some of whom seem to be Liverpool fans in the in the comments of the YouTube video, Liverpool and counter-pressing, uh, that were suggesting that they worry about going up against teams like Burnley, for example, who might sit very deep and defend, um, in, uh, you know, in which they're, because uh, one of the things we talked about in the, in the counter pressing video was that not only you know is the system geared towards winning the ball back quickly, but also uh, you you note that what it actually does do in certain circumstances is open up space in in the half space to attack with as well. So actually, you're getting a lot of your attacking opportunities through this uh, defensive system. Um, so how you know how how fair is it to suggest that it, that it might be a weaker system against a, a, a team who sits deeper and defends? I think it's entirely fair and I think you you can look at how Liverpool did last season and see very clearly in terms of their results that the teams they struggled most against were teams like Burnley or West Brom who played in a low block, um, didn't try and go forwards particularly and, and sort of countered the adage of, you know, if we don't have the ball um, or if we do have the ball, you can't attack. And it was almost like, well, if we get rid of the ball, then you can't attack. You know, just hoofing it long and and seeing what happens. Um, I mean, I think, firstly, I think if you've got a system that works really well against the very good teams and not so well against the not so good teams, don't change the system. Work out how to how to tweak it against the not so good teams. You know, I'm not saying for a second that that the way Klopp's got Liverpool playing is bad because they can't score against Burnley. Um, I think what they need to do is adjust in-game and try to push forwards more, try to rely less on the opportunities that are... I mean, almost sort of take it back to, OK, well, how would we get round this team just anyway how how would you defeat a low block how would you defeat a burnley side who drop in very very narrowly with very very compressed um two lines of four who throw players into into blocking situations to cover the goalkeeper that kind of stuff what i mean i guess it's a, it's a personnel question as well because i suppose one of the ways of doing that presumably would be to go over the top or around the side of it um mm. but i mean if they don't you know they don't themselves have a Romelu Lukaku, let's say they have Roberto Firmino, yeah. um, but he's not the aerial presence that that you you might like him to be in in that sort of situation. Well, you so can't. Is, is it a personnel question as well? Uh, yes, I think to an extent it is. So, so Firmino, well, that whole front th- should have kept three. Ricky Lambert. <laughs> well, kind of that 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 whole front three is is very very good at dropping into uh, the the space in between the lines and also drifting into the half spaces. Now, if you're playing a team like Burnley there is almost no space between the lines because their lines are so um, vertically compressed that there's nowhere to operate. So if that is the case, then actually, yes, what you need to do effectively is is go around the sides or over the top. That's why, if you look at Arsenal, for example, Olivier Giroud has, yeah. has always been retained because Olivier Giroud is the option B in that regard. Which, given how you know good Arsenal are as a side and how many sides are likely to defend against them, yeah. uh, option B comes up pretty frequently. Yes, because because teams are, you know, it. I'm not going to say that it's 
easy to coach or arrange defences because it clearly isn't and you can only you know, look at the evidence of how teams like Arsenal and, and Liverpool have struggled with a simple back four. However, generally speaking, if you work on coaching, a defensive system like Burnley clearly spent a huge amount of time and effort in doing last season and did so quite brilliantly, then you can nullify particular types of attacking threats. And you can say, if we defend narrowly and if we defend deep and if we defend compactly, then those sides that like to play through teams and like to drop off into space are going to struggle against us. And those teams that go long or go wide at pace and then try and pull back to a, a striker that's running across the near post, they're the teams that we need to worry about. Yeah, um, yeah. And and it's only sensible coaching to have a second option. And I think the issue with Liverpool is that they have they have too many. <laughs> it's going to sound like a ridiculous thing to say. They have no, they on. have too many really talented players. <laughs> but of the same sort of general yeah. style, yeah. shape, size. Well, let the, for that reason, let's move on to the next question because I wonder whether this, you know, could be something that Mo Salah could bring to Liverpool. What I was going to ask you is, how, you know, how do you think he's going to do next season? Mohamed Salah, of course, was recruited uh, by Liverpool this summer. Um, sitting the opposite flank to Sadio Mane, I mean, that that really is quite a frightening prospect, isn't it? Perhaps that sort of speedy wing play is exactly the sort of thing that might get Liverpool past teams like Burnley. I Yeah, it could well do. I mean, you know, the, the prospect of defending against Salah and Mane would, would terrify pretty much anybody. Um, mm. And they've already looked extremely sharp in pre-season. I caught some of the um, Audi Cup and again, like you caveated at the beginning, this will be broadcast after the first weekend. So who knows what they'll do. But in, in those games that I saw, they both looked very, very strong and they linked very, very well together. And, yeah. and I think what what you can do with that front three um, is both of those players, uh, Salah and Mane, can, can swap sides and play kind of cutting inside onto their stronger foot or going wide on their stronger foot, depending on which side they're on. And changing the point of attack rapidly like that and having the close control, uh, the dribbling skills that they both have, that could well be the way to break through those teams. I do still think you're right that, that Liverpool could benefit from having a more physical, more direct style of centre-forward. Um, I mean, Firmino is a very good player, but he's kind of a, he's sort of a nine and a half, really, isn't he? Well, retrospectively, it's a real shame that Mario Balotelli didn't work out. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's you can sum Balotelli's career up with that sentence. Um, but yes, I think that's absolutely right. Um, he would... Well, well, okay, on to the, uh, onto the final thing that, that could be a struggle for Liverpool as well, or maybe not. This is what you're here to answer for us. Alex, I spoke with Seb last week about Tottenham and about how their lack of transfer business could be an issue this season from a squad strength perspective, um, particularly due to the physical attrition of their style of play. And so with that in mind, you know, given that Liverpool play a very similar, you know, um, high energy style of football, is that a concern for Liverpool going into the season as well? Can they can they sustain a challenge throughout the season with you know with this system employed? I think I think it's a good question. Um, I mean, Liverpool I think probably have got a few more young players who could come in and do well. So Trent Alexander Arnold could um, step in for Nathaniel Klein at right back, for example. Then you've got people like Ben Woodburn. Um, is it Ryan Kent? I think um, so. There are there are some players that could come in and do do reasonably, particularly I guess against slightly weaker opposition. Um, I think for both teams, what will be crucial is how European football is handled and whether they play with the same almost slightly manic intensity in European football as they do in the Premier League. It suits the Premier League particularly well because it is a, a frenetic league. It's very backwards and forwards um, at, at pace. And so the opportunities for pressing and counter-pressing 
are pretty high. If you then take it into Europe, particularly against the better teams, then I think those those opportunities lessen. And if you still try and play the same kind of helter-skelter style, A, it's probably less effective tactically, but also you aren't you aren't maximizing the 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 physical opportunities of playing a slightly lower paced lower tempo style of of game so i don't think pochettino and klopp are are stupid enough to get their players to go 100 miles an hour in every match unless they feel that there is sufficient depth in the squad to to be able to handle that i i would be worried i would be more worried as a spurs fan probably than as as a Liverpool fan, um, I think Spurs will have real problems if Trippier gets injured and uh, real problems if Kane gets injured. Whereas I think there's more flexibility in the way Liverpool play up front and a bit more depth at the back. I still think Liverpool's centre, sorry, centre backs aren't very good, um, but but sort of out wide in defence and through the midfield, they have got players that can come in for two or three games at a time if they need them. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll be looking forward to the season to see how both teams shape up. Alex Stewart, thank you very much for your time. We'll chat to you again soon. Okay, I look forward to it. Thanks, Joe. And thanks to listeners for listening to the podcast. See you next week. Mm -hmm.